So if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them cover, of course, the most salient point of the gospel story, which is that Christ died on a cross for our sins. He died as a substitute. He died in our place. He had no sins, but he was punished by God, not just died by crucifixion, which thousands died that way, but he died suffering the very pangs of hell in our place so that we could sing, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. All four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John cover that. They all cover the resurrection, of course. And there's different instances where Jesus appears after he's risen from the dead. He stayed on earth for about 40 days, off and on appearing in odd places, odd ways to people uh, to prove that he was alive. And what was strange about it is that his body was exactly his body as it looked when he was, before he died. And now it had the nail prints and a spear mark in the side. And yet, and he could eat. He ate food once with them, uh, the disciples. But then in another sense, his body was a supernatural resurrection body that could just appear, disappear. He could stop people from seeing who he was. So there's a lot that we don't understand about this glorified body, which one day we're going to have. You know, you're going to get a new body. How many are in shopping right now for a new body? I'd like to get a new body. The shoulder of mine is killing me. Um, so what's odd, though, look, the women saw him at the tomb. Um, he appeared to the disciples, although the doors were locked. He just appeared to them, the 11. Judas was no longer with them. But oddly... Luke, and only Luke, tells about an appearance Jesus made and then spends more Bible verses writing about it than any other appearance that Jesus made. Some appearances of Jesus are only referred to. We know nothing about them. He appeared to Peter. What happened? When? Where? What did he say? How long? We don't know. He appeared to James, his half-brother, who didn't believe in him when he was just ministering, it seems, but he made a private appearance to James, and James later became a head elder probably of the church in Jerusalem. But this instance of Luke is a lengthy one. Two men, one is named Cleopas, the other one is unnamed, and they're walking down after the crucifixion. They're walking away from Jerusalem to go back to their home on the road to Emmaus. And... It's a long story, so I'll break it up because I think there's something really important now for Resurrection Sunday that we find in it. Let's look at the beginning of it in Luke 24. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. So hold it there. So they're just walking and they're talking like, what in the world happened? We thought this was the one as we're gonna find out and we were followers of him and now everything's snuffed out in a second. It's gone. They, they captured him and he didn't, push, he didn't speak words of power and get out of that mess. And what, what's going on? Suddenly another man joins them and just starts walking along in a friendly manner with them. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, but we had hoped, but our hope had been that he was the one, the Messiah, that was going to redeem Israel. 
And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions, Peter, John, especially, went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. So now the Lord is walking with them, but they do not know that it's him. And they're all in consternation, discouraged, downcast, because life isn't working out the way they thought it would. Did you ever have that happen in your life? Things don't work out the way you think they would. Or God doesn't do what you were hoping he would do in the way that you were banking on him doing it. And now they're discouraged, but they have hope, but yet they're discouraged. What we had hoped, but now what do we know? And they're confused because what's this wild story? The tomb is empty. How could the tomb be empty? You know, dead people don't get out and leave. But yet the, the, the ladies went and they came. By the way, that's interesting that the first evangelists to tell the world that Jesus was alive were not the apostles, but the women. The women. All right, women, sit down. All right, hey. Wow. You all are ready, aren't you? Onward. So women were the first ones who were the evangelists. The good news, Jesus is alive. So... They had come and told the disciples, he's alive. The tomb is empty. And we saw some angels and this. So Peter and John ran there. John the Younger outran them, went in. And now they didn't know what, because the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away, but where's the body? But where's Jesus? So they're in consternation. Everyone's confused. Nobody, it seems, remember, they had just uh, days earlier when he was arrested, they all fled. Boy, look at that. Three and a half years with Jesus, and yet when he was arrested, they were all out of town. They were just gone. It speaks to us that we can be strong at one moment when things are looking good, but when the bottom falls out, we lose our faith like in a millisecond. How, how many know that's true? For some, right? We know that. The Bible's true to life here. So they're walking, they're talking, and then this stranger is walking with them. So what happens next? He said to them, Jesus, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So listen up, escuche, listen. He said to them, you all are so slow to believe what the scripture says. He pointed them to the Bible, and I want to point you to the Bible. You can't live the Christian life without feeding, the Bible, feeding yourself with the Bible every day. And forget about coming to Brooklyn Tabernacle once a week. That won't cut it. You need God's word every single day. Do you, do, do you eat food once a week? No. You're eating food every day. That's to be healthy. So, and the right food. So he pointed them to the Bible, and he said... What are you all concerned and bewildered by? Don't you know what it says in the Bible about Messiah? Now remember, there was no New Testament. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no Romans, no first and second Peter. None of it had been written. But he pointed them to the Old Testament and he said, don't you know that the law, Moses, prophets, the book of poetry, Psalms, whatever, don't you know that there's many places in there that talk about me? about Messiah. He hasn't said me yet to them. They talk about Messiah. So why are you confused that Messiah had to suffer when the Bible says he had to suffer? But if you don't know the Bible or you don't believe the Bible, life will catch you like, 
Like people saying today, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Look how crazy it is. If you read what Jesus said, he said it would be like that. The days would get more evil. Lawlessness will increase. So some of you, if you're wasting your time putting your hope in the Democrats or the Republicans, wake up and smell the coffee. It's gonna be just like God said it's gonna be. And that gives you peace in the storm and you know what's gonna happen instead of going up and down with the news and all of that stuff. So what did he tell them? Well, he pointed them to places in the Old Testament and he opened their minds so they could understand like this was spoken about Messiah. So it had to happen. Why are you all bewildered? For example, he pointed them to verses like in Isaiah. This is 500 years before Jesus was born, thereabouts, hundreds of years. Surely, speaking of Messiah, surely he took our pain and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. When he was on the cross, we're trying to figure out why would God let such a person get a beat down like that? But it was predicted. Before it ever happened, God knew it would happen. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. What they did to him on the cross wasn't for him, it was for us. So that we could sing and worship today. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. He was punished so I can have peace. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sin is so horrible in your life and my life. In thought, in word, in deed, there are sinful things. And for us to have fellowship with God and communion and relationship, God laid on him all the sin and punished him so we, by faith in him, could be free. We're free. Our sins have been forgiven. Isn't anybody happy like that about that? Lift your hand. Come on, lift your hand if you're happy about that. All our sins were laid on him. This is gospel 101. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. That, imagine, it spoke about how Jesus would react to punishment and Pilate and the chief priests and Caiaphas and all of that. He didn't open his mouth like a sheep led to the slaughter. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? There was nobody there to say, don't do this to him, nobody. The crowd was saying, crucify him. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was punished hundreds of years before it happened that he was arrested and went to the cross. The Bible tells us that God spoke about it. And that's something, the way we, all of us, uh, make a mess of things by reacting when, when suffering comes. But he was like a lamb. He accepted it, didn't say a word. In Argentina, many times, the gauchos, the people down there, is the cattle capital of the world, beef capital of the world, but they also kill a lot of cordero, which is sheep, which are sheep. And they said, one thing to kill a cow, another thing to kill a pig. They're out there in the open and you kill a pig and if you don't get it right, it runs around like a pig, just (laughs) bleeding and screaming. But a lamb, it looks at you and you're putting the knife through it to kill it and it just keeps looking at you. Not a word, not a sound. And like a lamb led to the slaughter, Jesus, for you and me, he was crucified. So he opened up the scriptures and said to them, come on, guys, don't you... Don't, don't you know this was supposed to happen to Messiah? This concept of a Messiah driving around in a Rolls Royce, victorious with a chariot or whatever, that's not in the Bible for his first coming. And then he opened up other verses like in uh, 
let's look at, it's quoted in Acts, so let's look at it. David said about him, I, this is from Psalm uh, 16. I saw the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. In other words, I'm not gonna stay dead. Now, who is, who is David talking about? You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, Peter says, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Messiah would sit on the throne of David. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. So Jesus was going back. That's Peter using it in his first Christian sermon. But Jesus went with these two men, and he opened the scriptures, and he showed them, don't, you don't have to be upset you should have known it was coming that way, but they didn't. They had their human ideas about Messiah. Just like some of us here in this room, we got, we got our ideas about Christianity, how we think Christians act. Instead of going to the Bible and saying, what, what does God say about Christianity and about faith in Christ? So he opens the scriptures to them. And now as he's walking with them, he's endearing himself to them. They're, they're bonding with him. Who is this stranger that knows the Old Testament so well? And he's saying things we never even saw before. How many have ever read a verse in the Bible that you know of, but then when you read it, suddenly it comes alive to you? How many have ever had that happen? And you go, what? Where, where was that? I never saw that. So now, the end of the story. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So we went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke the bread. And he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Hold that for a second. Go back, I'm sorry. While he talked with us, this is one of the signs when the, the, the meeting is a good meeting that when the word is spoken or when you have a Bible study alone with, with the Lord and the, your heart starts to burn, the words become alive to you. No, oh, that's a good meeting. Not the preacher acting out and, and going crazy on the, on the stage, but oh, didn't our hearts burn within us? Oh, I like when God gives me burning words. How many say amen to that? <laughs> Purging out the junk that shouldn't be in there giving us new life, reinvigorating our spiritual life. Didn't our hearts burn within us while he opened the scriptures? Go ahead. And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the 11 disciples and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two the two men told what had happened on the way and how Jesus, well, listen, Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread, when he had fellowship. So, in this room, there's three kinds of people. We're, we're so different in many ways, but basically there's three kinds of people when it comes to the resurrection. 
There's number one people, possibly, although I, I would wonder why you're here on Easter Sunday. But in the city and around the world, there's people who do not believe, no crayon. They do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They have no belief in that. They think it's preposterous. They think it's a joke. They think it's uh, fanaticism. It's associated with holy roller religion and, and just craziness. Because they say, you know, how could a dead person come alive? But in case anyone is here like that or has strong doubts about that, I'd like to just point out two things. Number one, uh, just because you and I can't imagine something doesn't mean God can't do it. Because with God, nothing is impossible. So now, more and more, the scientists and the experts are saying, and they've proven, the earth is not eternal. This earth has not always been here. You know, in the 1400s, 1500s, uh, before that, most scientists and ministers uh, believed that the earth was the center of the universe that the sun and everything was moving around it because the sun came up, the sun went down. Obviously, the sun is moving. And it was for centuries that no one really came to the conclusion till it was proven, no, no, no. The sun is the center of our, our world. And everyone's moving around the sun and the planets. You remember those classes you failed in junior high school, remember? <laughs> Venus, Uranus, all that. So, but then what was hard is how could the earth be moving and people don't fall off? Did you know that the earth, while I'm talking today, is moving at 65,000 miles per hour, making its circle around the sun? 65,000 miles per hour. That's moving. So, and they said the earth is eternal. It's always been here, but it hasn't always been here. And now they have fine-tuned through observation and calculations that the earth, all matter, all energy, and time itself, which is hard for us to comprehend because we're in the, in the capsule of time, that time, energy, and all matter began at a single moment. There was a big bang and everything exploded and is moving, in fact, today, still moving away. The furthest reaches of the universe that they find are still moving away, which means they started back at some point in distant time. Well, how did everything come out of nothing? That no one has an answer to. But obviously, we're, we all, we're all here. There's planets, there's seasons, we're living, and we're, I mean, there was no designer, there was nobody to put this whole thing in motion. But because we can't imagine, it doesn't mean God can't just speak. In the beginning, God created <laughs> the heavens and the earth, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. So if God can do that, what is it about raising someone from the dead? That's a big thing. If God can make something out of nothing, no materials to work with. All of us here are in a world that started with nothing to work with. He didn't take a little thing with toolbox and say, let's shape this thing. No, there was nothing. But on top of that, and more germane to the Easter Sunday, why don't you believe anybody here? Why don't you believe what the people said who saw him? Why don't you believe what Peter said or the two men on the road to Emmaus or the ladies that were, went to the tomb? Why wouldn't you believe them? Oh, the old, uh, the old hiding place is they made it up. But I'm asking you something. You're all smart. Why would they make it up? I believe in the depravity of human beings that we're all selfish as can be unless God gets a hold of us. And we're greedy. And people will run a scam. You ever watch those programs, American Greed? 
Oh my goodness. I mean, for money, people will do crazy things or get rid of their spouse for the insurance money. But why would they make that up? All they got was a beating for saying it. All they got was to be persecuted. All they got was to lose their jobs and be separated from their children and their wives. Why would someone make up a story they saw someone when it meant whoosh, why would they? I'm asking you. Uh, give me a reason. I'm, I'm open to anyone who would like to say, here was their end game. They thought by making up that story, they could all become millionaires. Then I'll follow you. And I'll say, okay, I get it. They did that because they knew if they said that, they would be on fat, in Fat City. But they weren't in Fat City. They weren't on AC Street. They got pummeled and pushed and persecuted. And all they had to do to get out of it was say, all right, it's a joke. He ne we never saw him. And they wouldn't say it. They rather died. Jesus is alive. Can we put our hands together? Jesus is alive. So, but there's another group of people. And now more directed to the audience here. You believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I would imagine it must be so or you wouldn't be here. But it's a mental belief that has very little effect on your lives. Oh yeah, Jesus is alive. Jesus rose from the dead. Come on. Pastor Simba, what do you think? I'm a pagan? Jesus rose from the dead. But what effect does that have on your life? It's so, solo su cabeza, only your head. It's in your head, that's all. Every day you live as if he were as dead as any dead person could be. You hardly ever talk to him. You don't expect him to do anything. You don't live with the consciousness, Jesus is alive and he's with me. No, 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 you don't. All kinds of millions of churchgoers today, Roman Catholic, Protestant, they're going and they're going to make the sign of the cross and do the stations of the cross and sing, he lives, he lives, I know he lives. But once they leave the building, it's as if Jesus didn't even exist, much less raised, raised from the dead. And that's the most seductive lie that Satan has. Okay, mentally affirm he's alive. Come on, I'm religious. I grew up in a church. I was Christian. I was, uh, did first communion or whatever. And, and, but has no effect on your life. It's just if he doesn't even exist. This, is that not true? Look at all the miserable lives that are lived by people who go to church and affirm the Apostles' Creed that Jesus was raised from the dead. But there, there, there's no joy, no peace, fighting with everyone, racist tendencies, whether white, black, or whatever. They live as if that the cross never happened, the resurrection never happened. And yet if you press them and say, do you believe Jesus is alive? Yes, I do. I'll argue till two in the morning, he's alive. But the minute they leave, no mas. No mas Cristo. No more Jesus. Isn't that the way it is with some of you? Oh, yes, it is. I know that from my own life. You can believe in your head that Jesus is alive, but he's not alive to you. He's not alive to you. And that's the whole point. He wants to be alive to you. He didn't raise from the dead just so that we would run around today and say, he lives, he lives. He was raised from the dead so that he would not only grant us salvation, but we would have fellowship with him. Talk to him, hear from him, walk with him. Come on, let's put our hands together and say amen. That's why. Verdad? No verdad. It's true. It's true. That's traditional Christianity. That's the worst way to go to hell. Going to church, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Day? I never knew you. I never knew you. I was never alive to you. You never believed with your heart. It wasn't a reality to you. You never let the Holy Spirit make me real to you. I was never the center of your life. You never got directions from me. You never got your values from me and my word. You just went to church on Sunday and held up a pretense of being a Christian. Well, that's true. 
That's true. That's the saddest way to end your life. Be buried in a graveyard with a tombstone with a cross on it, but that Jesus was never alive to you. Never alive. But these men, notice as I close, these men, this is something else. They said this, this three words which have meant something so much to me since I'm 16, 17 years old. They said to him, uh, if you would come, Jamal, and play all the glory of your presence. Listen, they said, abide with me. Don't go further down the road. It's getting dark. The way the NIV has it is, stay with us, please. We don't even know your name, but there's something about being with you that changes everything. How many have found that about Jesus, being with him? Being with Jesus, listen, changes everything. Everything is different when you're with having fellowship with the Lord. And did you know that's what he wants for us this morning? He doesn't want us just to say and affirm and sing because he lives and all of that, that has its place. But he, he, he wants us not only to have relationship, but to have fellowship. There's a difference between relationship and fellowship. You can even be born again Christian here today, but have very little fellowship with the Lord. Let me, let me show you there from 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Look at this. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Not just relationship. Relationship is I become a child of God by putting my faith in Christ. I am now a son or and a daughter of Christ. That's good. That's relationship. That's how you become a Christian. You got to be born again into the family of God. But not everybody in the family talks. You can have relationship and hardly any fellowship. And that's the great need in your life today. That's why things aren't working out the way they should inside of you, get, granting you peace and power and direction. It's because you might have relationship, but you don't have fellowship. Many, many, many years ago, we had a, we had a girl come in this church from the Lower East Side, and I didn't meet her the first Sunday she came. Her name was Amalia, and Amalia got saved in the service, gave her heart to Christ when I made an appeal, but I didn't meet her, didn't, wasn't aware of her. She came to the office uh, two days later in our previous building and she wanted to get baptized. So the pastors met with her and they talked to her and then they brought her in to see me. And they said, this is Amalia. And she looked kind of hard, kind of, you know, street light. And uh, I, I said, the pastor had been crying so he wanted me to hear something. So then Amaya tells us very quickly that her father started coming in her bedroom when she was about 10 or nine or 10 and abusing her every night, just about. So she got to the place where she got the courage to get a screwdriver and she hid it under his pillow, her pillow, hoping that she would get the nerve that when he came in, she would drive it through his neck and kill him, but he didn't. She never got the nerve to do that. Well, anyway, she fled the house. The mother, I always felt the mother knew, but was in denial, knew something was going on. So Maya's messed, messed up. She leaves at 14, looking and acting much older. She lives with men. She lives with some women. She's into everything. Has three or four abortions. And then keeps one of her pregnancies and uh, has a little boy and ends up dancing topless in uh, down Times Square when it was really nasty. And uh, comes in, feels the love of God, is told that Jesus is alive, gives her heart to the Lord and gets saved. By the time she tells me her testimony and I'm leaving out uh, certain parts on purpose. So I'm, uh, I'm like, wow. <laughs> goodness. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the blood applied. If anyone is in Jesus Christ, they're a new creation. Old things pass away. I don't care how messed up anyone is here. Jesus can ch change it and turn it around. So 
in that building, I used to sit on the platform with Pastor Hammond and whatnot, and she used to be in the front of the balcony and uh, on the Lower East Side. And I would see her put her arms up in the air, and I remember how it would break me when I saw her worshiping God, when I knew her story and all she had been through, and now she's worshiping Jesus, and I was just like, God, you are awesome. God, you are awesome. Is God awesome or not? So, a month or five weeks into her conversion, she's not there. And I noticed it, and I prayed for her. I remember praying, oh God, please don't let the enemy try to ruin what you started here. I see her the next Sunday, she runs up to me in the little lobby we had at the back of that theater. And she hugs me and we talk and I said, I missed you last Sunday. She said, yeah, I went upstate. I said, what'd you go upstate for? She said, I went to see my father. Your father? Yeah. Had to do it, pastor. So I told him, daddy, listen, father, I've always hated you. You've ruined my life. I wanted to kill you. I didn't have the nerve. But guess what? I have Jesus now. He's changed my life. And listen, she shared Jesus with him. Now, did they have relationship? Could you go to the Department of Health and find a birth certificate that he's the father of that child? Yeah. Did they have fellowship? You can have relationship, but very little, if any, fellowship. Oh, my goodness. In my own, uh, in my own extended family on my mother's side, I had an aunt and an uncle that didn't talk to each other for like nine years over some spat. Were they brother and sister? Yeah. Did they have fellowship? No. And Jesus loves us so much that he said, I not only died to save you, I want to have fellowship. He wants to have fellowship with me and you. Is that not rich? What would he want to be with a scoundrel like me? But his love is so great that he says, I want to walk with you. I want to have fellowship with you. Don't live alone. Live with me. Let me walk down the road with you. Let me sit and break bread with you. And oh, when you have fellow with Jesus fellowship, your eyes will get open. You'll see all kinds of things. You'll have new hope. Life becomes so beautiful. You'll know no enemy can defeat me. I got Jesus with me. If it's only in your head, you, you, you fall to pieces. Because it's a concept. Jesus is not a concept. Jesus is alive. Come on, put your hands together. He's alive. He's listening to me. Come on up here, choirs. He, he's listening to me right now. He knows everything you're going through. Don't you get it? He's alive. Don't study him like a historical figure. Abraham Lincoln, Julius Caesar, Napoleon. He's not a historical figure. He's alive and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, I close with this. I don't want this for anyone here today. I don't want you to have an Easter like you used to have an Easter. I want a new Easter. Look, Revelation 3, verse 20. Written to Christians. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, notice, and eat with that person and they with me. What's he speaking about? Fellowship. I'm knocking on the door. Put your phone down. And eat with me. Have fellowship with me. Stop running around like a chicken without your head. Stop trying to make money. And that's all you're, you live for is your money. Open the door. I'm knocking at the door. I mean, if I were Jesus and my own people didn't want me in, the door was shut, I'd say, then good, I'll forget about it. I'll find some other people. But no, he loves you and I so much, he's knocking at the door. Don't you hear him knocking, some of you, right now? While I'm talking, you don't hear him knocking, saying, I got a better life for you in me than what you're experiencing. You got too head heavy. It's too much mental. It's got to be more corazón, your heart. Walk with me. Fellowship with me. I want to help you. Why are you struggling with what you're going through when the Lord is waiting to help all of us? He's alive. Nothing's too hard for him. Oh, I know, but pastor, you know, I got a neighbor and she's doing voodoo and hoodoo on me. 
My foot, she can't do anything. Jesus is with you. Come on, Jesus is with you. La last thought, then we're gonna sing. You know, uh, you know how you can tell who where Jesus is really alive to someone and not mental? You watch how they worship. I was watching Sue and, and the singer, the choir, and I was watching so many of you. It was as if he was like 10 feet from you. He's a living Christ. He wasn't some concept. If it's just a concept, you know, they're just like. So if you look at someone and say, oh my, they're emotional. They're, they're, th this is a very hyper kind of uh, emotional religion fanaticism. No, it's not. He's alive. And he's done so much for us, we can't stop praising him. Am I right, congregation? Come on, am I right? He's alive. He's listening to me. So, he's knocking at the door. Look at me, he's knocking at the door. And all he's saying is, I love you, open the door. Just open the door and what? I'll come in and have fellowship with you. Then everything will change. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. That was written to Christians. Some people might be Christians, but they're living like 150 miles from where the Lord is. He wants fellowship. Just close your eyes. everyone who's doubting, everyone sitting on the fence, Lord. Speak to them. <clears throat> Listen to the choir sing. Listen. relationship with him you haven't really received him but even if you have received him you're here today and you're it's not like it should be I don't want to be confrontational but it's not the way it should be and you know it you know it as sure as you know you're sitting here there was once a day maybe you were so much closer in fellowship with the Lord and we are the losers when we don't have that fellowship so as we begin to sing this again, everyone's gonna sing. I want you to slip out of your seat right now. Just come up and come to the front and say, I'm ending this Easter Sunday service saying, abide with me, Jesus. Abide with me in mi casa, in my house, in my heart, on my job, with my children. I want you, Lord. Come on, let's sing loud while they're coming. Sing, everyone.
that door. Open that door. Say, Lord, fellowship. I want fellowship with you. I want to walk down the road. I'm saying to you, abide with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't leave. Stay with me. first word but what's the, the, the line I love you Lord the goodness of God I feel like saying that how many have a testimony today all your life you, he's been so faithful okay so those who have to go go we're gonna sing for a little while the singers are the choir is done here with this service because of the 12 noon presentation so sing with us or leave or hug one another do put an offering in. Remember the needs of the church. God bless you. I love you. 